Good morning to those joining us on the FJMC webinar. Our speaker this morning is A.J. Coleman of the Chicago area, who has recently written a book entitled Keep Those Feet Moving. It addresses all sorts of uh, concerns from the standpoint of going through uh, trying times, coping with grief, thriving against all odds. Uh, also uh, uh, has uh, references and uh, very uh, significant points relative to someone who has recently suffered a loss as well. So I'll introduce uh, AJ, uh, who will uh, introduce himself more fully and uh, we'll go into the presentation. Thank you. I would ask that everyone mute themselves uh, at this time. Great. Thank you, Norman. It's a pleasure being here today and coming to you each and every one of you to speak a little bit about uh, grief and how it impacts us all, but also share a little perspective about my life and what I've done. And really what I'd like to see taken away from this discussion is just to little, be a little bit more informed about how you can cope and overcome grief. And it's something that's on topic on a lot of our mind. We have lots of loved ones, we have job losses, we have companionship losses. We, it's just the world that we have around us, it's just grief. And you don't have to always live in grief and you can always move forward. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, just, you know, before I get into myself, you know, one of the things I like to start out with is analogies and helps me relate to our audience and help me to relate to you. And uh, one of my favorite things is a roller coaster. And I really always believe that life is like a roller coaster. You know, you've got a lot of thrills, you've got ups and downs, twists and turns. And depending on who you are, you may have a lot of excitement when you ride them. Some people put their hands in the air, some people scream, some people just close their eyes and look away and just pray that, you know, when's it gonna be done? But that's what life is all about. And, and there's sometimes that we just don't know. We can predict, we can foresee things, but rarely do they ever come to um, the aspect that we're going to be target of on where the event actually is. And that, that's why the roller coasters, when you come back to the end of the ride, it's like you look around and then you do your self-assessment. Like, oh, that wasn't so bad. Or, yeah, that was horrible. And that's kind of where we go with grief as well. Um, a little about myself. So uh, I'm AJ Coleman. I have been writing for about a couple of years now on some blogs and about grief and how to overcome. And uh, somebody said, hey, why don't you write a book? And then I thought, well, what do I know about writing a book? I mean, all those years of English class. And I thought, well, you know, how is that going to prepare me? And I found that it's actually a lot more challenging than it sounds. And the idea behind the book, Keep Those Feet Moving, is sort of to give back to those who have been impacted by grief, different types of losses. And it could be necessarily about everything that you've gone through. Um, a little about who I am. Uh, I was a widower at 33 years old. My wife was diagnosed with cancer the year prior. And just going through the treatments, going through the life, it just, I wasn't prepared. And at 33 years old, we had a newborn daughter now one year old that relied on me for support and everything. And I had to find ways to channel that grief, channel that anger. And I didn't know how to. I didn't know about resource groups. I didn't know that there was support out there. And a lot of friends and family that we had at the time, they, they didn't know how to support it, right? It, we were young and people didn't want to address it. Uh, but through the years, I have learned to come through and use some of these techniques to help me not only thrive, but come today and talk about it and help others go through. You know, when we talk about grief, you know, what I've lost with my spirituality, I've lost my faith, I have lost my numerous jobs. I mean, that all comprises right into the same notion of what grief loss is. So, you know, at the time, uh, I've done a lot of podcasts as of recently. I've made some TV appearances and written some more articles. And my work is just really beginning and just really honored to have the opportunity to be here today with you. So let's just dive right in. You know, the purpose of these slides is to help guide you and promote interactive discussion as we go along here. But, you know, one of the things about grief 
is I like to call it to celebrate the life, not the loss. And a lot of times what happens is, is that when we are in grief, we're thinking and we're mourning and we're really not sure what to have, what to go through in life. And, you know, a question I always get is what is grief? And to me, it's just a natural response to death or a loss. And the type of grief that we're talking about, people always equate it with the loved one or something else, but it can be much more than that. It could be a job, a position, maybe a loss of income or a pet runs away or kids leave home and they go to college or after college to go out into the real world. You know, if a major life changes can also cause some kind of grief because there's a physical void that's sort of left behind where you're used to seeing that person, touching, feeling, and even just completely having a conversation. And what happens here is very common to get lost in that transition and just fall into that grief period. And it's something that a lot of people just don't know how to respond to it. And what happens are people just decide to close the shades of their bedroom and just go to sleep for days, or they go to different aspects of life, just kind of wandering in a daze. Um, but, you know, these, these are all natural. You know, everybody experiences grief differently. Everybody heals differently. And there is no set blueprint on what you're supposed to do, how long the process lasts, and what you're supposed to say to people. But one of the most common questions that are really asked is like, you know, how long is this mourning period supposed to be? And the short answer is, it can be however long or short you want it to be. It really falls on you as an individual and how you want to move forward. Right. A lot of times we go through discussions, we talk to professionals, we talk to friends, we talk to family, but sometimes we just can't move forward in things and we just stay in that period of mourning. And I've always believed that it's okay to mourn, it's okay to uh, understand that what's happened is temporary, but it doesn't necessarily mean you have to spend your entire life in that same state of mind. And a lot of times people will say, well, the different type of mourning is just the same as losing a pet or a friend or a parent or a sibling or even a child or a loved one. And, you know, they're all different and there's nothing that is going to tell you why you have to grieve a certain way. Grief is just how you feel. It's being in that moment in time and seeing, well, how do I come through that loss and what happens? You know, I think a lot of us have pets and that's tough too. The short period of life that we have and they almost become like our fur children. And what happens that? Should we be mourning that differently than we mourn maybe a parent or a relative or even a friend? And the answer goes straight back to the point. Like what you feel is comfortable with is the most important. There isn't a set of rules that says, okay, well, for pets, you do this. For parents, you do this, for loved ones, you do that. It's all based on how you come through and you walk through your own footsteps. You know, the point, you know, what point do you let go? And again, it, it depends on that mindset. There are times when I refer to when you're letting go, it's not like you're forgetting the individual, right? You're celebrating their life still. It's that you're not going to let that physically and mentally impact you on a day-to-day -day basis. And some people, they just can brush up and say, you know what, I've mourned for a couple of days, I've mourned for a couple of weeks, I've mourned for even a month or a year, but I'm not going to let this stop me from moving and living my life to the fullest. And that's really what's critical when you learn to let go. It's just you're letting go of the burden that you feel inside. You're not losing that memory. You're not going to pass up on those anniversaries. It's just you're slowly saying, okay, I'm here. And that's when you start transitioning yourself into how do you overcome and how do you ultimately cope? Next slide, Nolan, please. So this is one of my favorite quotes that I have out here. It's really something that resonates well with me. It's that strength doesn't come from how you overcome challenges. Strength comes in how you respond to adversity and how you rise up and stand tall. We all have setbacks. We all experience loss to some great. It's just how do you stand up and move forward? 
And that's really the key, right? You know, each challenge is different. We may have a challenge because we're driving to work and we're frustrated with the traffic, but we also may have a challenge that we're in fear of losing a job if we're always late. You know, there are different things that we have that impact us all from a grief standpoint. And when you're in that state of fear or in that mindset, it becomes overwhelming and you start feeling yourself with the emotional burden, but you've got to find strength from somewhere. And it's not how you overcome those challenges, it's how you respond. And that's really the key word in this whole thing. And how do you respond there? You can respond by doing something bigger, better, going to step up, or you may decide, you know, I'm just going to see where this goes. And again, that's where the strength comes in, is start recognizing where you are. And some of the coping mechanisms that are out there that are really important is that when you have your loved ones, including your pets, you know, that have physically departed from you, they will always be in your heart. You carry them with you. And if you ever notice that you find yourself talking out loud to that particular person or that particular pet, you know, it's just some sense of comfort. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Everyone should mute themselves, please. Uh, and that, that's the hard thing. And I've always said that the hardest part about any sort of loss is sort of a, a void that's left behind where, you know, if you have a loved one, you can't sit and talk to them, you can't call them, you can't do anything and to visit, right? If it's a loss of a job, you have a loss of income, you have the feeling that you're just not getting up and going to work the next day. Or you can have a loss of spirituality and faith and you just say, you know, I just don't believe in my religion anymore because I have experienced so much, I no longer understand why this is happening for me. So it's definitely where I say, you know, it comes from the boy itself. But if you carry it within your heart, and that's how you start to celebrate, and you start thinking about, okay, I'm not mourning a lot. I'm celebrating life. I'm keeping my loved one, or I'm keeping that job that I lost, but I'm going to do something bigger and better. And when it comes to mourning, you know, you need to stay in your own marathon race. It's not important you know, where you start or how fast that goes that matters, where you finish that matters the most. And a lot of times when you think about a marathon race, you know, you start to finish and you're going to go at whatever speed you're comfortable with. Some people run the whole way through, some people walk, some people jog, sometimes, you know, it's a combination of a lot of things, right? But at the end of the day, your most important goal is to complete that marathon race. And that's the same thing, right? And it goes back to what I had said earlier, that there is no blueprint on how you mourn, how you grieve, and how you move forward. It's just how you respond and how you take those steps to go. And it's more important to go at your own pace, not just because you read somebody or you talked to somebody who's gone through something similar and said, look, I rebounded in two months, you know, and then, then all of a sudden you're set on that baseline for two months. But no, that, that doesn't necessarily work because then it puts pressure on yourself and it only adds more stress and discomfort to your grieving process because now you're trying to measure up against what other people think, not necessarily what you think. And one of the key aspects in any type of mourning and grief is that you focus on the why aspect. And the why aspect is why did this happen? Why did this come through at this particular time? Why me? And you start trying to rationalize all the issues and all the faults that you've gone through. Why didn't I call that person? Why couldn't I save them? What could I have done more? All these questions you're asking yourself. And that, that does it prolongs that mourning period because you're fixated on the past. Why? What I like to say is when you celebrate the life, it focuses on the where aspect. Where are you going? How are you going to get there? Where is your sense of direction that you want to be later? Different people may equate this as like the how aspect, but I like to call it the where because when you keep those feet moving, 
you're moving, you're creating action, you're creating movement. And that's where you're going in life. Your feet, whether you're able to move forward is based on how you take those steps forward and how you move in your life. And once you start focusing more on the where aspect and focusing on the celebration of life, you're able to start going through and navigating through that grief loss. And that's really important. And that's, that's how you start to heal. And that's how you start to cope. And you're asking less questions of why, but you're asking more questions on the where. Very key points to help us grow internally and to fully understand. And then you're able to talk about it days, weeks, and even years later about that particular loss. And again, it doesn't necessarily always mean that your loss of a loved one, but again, the job, the spirituality, it's like, how are you growing inside? You use the terms fixed mindset, growth mindset back in a couple of years ago when it exploded, but it's sort of the same kind of concept is where you're going and how you're going to get there. And a lot of times people start with the, where am I going? And they're asking a question as to starting where they're at today. But sometimes you got to work backwards and figure out, say, okay, I want to be able to celebrate. I want to be able to overcome this loss. Now, where do I go to get there? And that's definitely a different type of mindset to go through. Next slide. So one of the things when no one asked me to speak today, and I try to think about three different topics that resonate most with many people. And we talk about grief of loss, and, but also from jobs, we've all experienced some sort of challenges with our jobs where we've had setbacks, where we either lost a position or we've had a downsize, or maybe we even just walked away. But there's still an element of grief that goes there because you're no longer doing what you're just doing and you have more questions. Now, if you're lucky, you'll have another opportunity around the corner, hopefully with better situation. But a job loss is the disappearance of a job, maybe voluntarily, involuntary. And, you know, sometimes it comes at the least amount of and what happens is there's a lot of emotional aspects that come through when there's any type of job lost. You know, it could be shock, it could be in denial, it could be, be anger. You may be trying to bargain with the individual, like, well, if I do this, I can stay. Or, you know, if we do this, I'll take less money if we can just keep my job. There's an element of depression that settles in. It's more of that just like disbelief. It's like, now what? Like, why, why doesn't somebody want me? Why doesn't somebody want me to work with them like what did I do and then what happens is sometimes you go into that acceptance thinking like okay it happened now what what do I do to move on and what the other areas of what we do is you start looking at different durations and intensities of the type of loss that's involved sadly if you have lost your job because you were fired or terminated due to performance, that's going to have a little bit of a different perception and grief process than maybe you decided, you know, having a downsize layoff where the company has been bought out and your position was eliminated. That maybe there's something more you couldn't really do in that role or other aspect. And what I like to think about is when you do go through your job loss, is to start asking yourself, what is it you really want to do in life? You know, there's a reason why this happened. And sometimes it gives you an opportunity to sit back and say, okay, what do I want? What do I want to accomplish? Is this a career for me? The other question is always, you know, what makes you happy? A lot of times we're in jobs because we feel we just need to because we have the financial means to stay in it. Or maybe there's a perception, you're in a prestigious job because that's what's expected from you through your education, through your peers, through anybody else that you're associated with, they're expecting you to have maintain certain status. But are you really happy? And think about what makes you happy in a job. 
Do you spend more time arguing and contemplating the negative aspects of it versus the positive? And then what do you want to do to earn a living? And this is really an opportunity where you see a lot of people changing careers. They're changing their ideas on how they want to earn. Some people quit their jobs because the commute is too long or there's not enough pay, or maybe unfortunately they don't enjoy being around their leadership team or they don't feel there's enough growth opportunity or empathy in there and they move on. But a lot of times when there's a loss of a job, it's really challenging and that's where the grief stage comes in. It's because it's a loss of some sort, but it gives you an opportunity to sort of restart and reset that button and say, okay, what do I want to really do? Like, what's going to make me happy? And how do I want to earn? And in some cases, you may do a 180 completely different. I read stories where there are attorneys that have quit their jobs due to the rigorous type of work and they become podcast individual and they spend their time earning a living on podcast and they're happy. Maybe they don't earn as much as they would have been an attorney, but they're happy doing what they're doing. And sometimes we get caught in situations like that unexpectedly, right? And sometimes it takes a loss for you to gain something. And that's something that's really important to remember. It's not every loss just is a loss. There is some sort of genuine gain that follows through. Uh, next slide. So, Job losses is only a temporary setback. You will rebound into a better opportunity. And that goes with that mindset, right? And asking yourself, very similar to the last concept we talk about in the grief loss area and celebrating the life, is you're focusing on that where. You will rebound for a better opportunity. How many times have we lost our jobs, changed jobs or something, and found that after looking back, it's like, I'm in a much better position than I was. I can't believe I stayed in that role or some other sort. But there are certain secrets that you can learn about landing your next job without compromising your sanity or mental health. And one of my most favorite aspects of these secrets is, you know, I like to look for jobs at night. It's quiet, a little less distractions. And let's be honest, how often does the phone ring during the daytime when you're searching for a job? It always rings at the moment you're busy or something else is coming up and you can't take the call. But searching for a job at night is not only helpful, it frees you up to do the stuff in the daytime that you wanna do, whether it's go for lunch with friends and family, spend time with your children, take your parents out, but it just allows you to know to have something going on in your daytime that you can accomplish, whether those are the errands. Jobs will always be there at nighttime. That's another secret. Don't sacrifice your entire day, waking up at eight o'clock in the morning and working till five, applying. But there's also a strategic element into looking for a job. You leverage your LinkedIn contact, you leverage your support groups, and you learn to navigate through. And the one thing that I will share with you that's in the book, but don't apply for jobs that have just been recently posted. And I'll share this with why. When times when jobs are posted, there might be hundreds of applicants and you're one of those hundreds of applicants that apply and you don't get a call. And you're like, why? I have all the right tools. I have all the right opportunity. I did everything I'm supposed to do. It's because you're competing with hundreds of people. Well, instead, wait to apply for those jobs that have been open by six weeks later. And each of these job boards they have sometimes when it was posted because it costs a lot of money for these employers to post these jobs. That means they haven't found the right candidate. So here you come along and apply for the opportunity. And maybe your resume is one of two resumes. Now your ratio percentage of landing an interview is drastically improved, right? And not only are the companies are getting desperate because they need to fill that role, 
they may even throw out more money and increase the compensation package to entice. If maybe their first pick, who they interviewed after the first week of the job being posted, wanted too much money, or maybe they didn't like the role itself and they had to go back and reevaluate. So there are secrets that are out there to help you land successfully and to bounce back into better opportunities. One of the key areas that we like to think about is our own health. And when we're in a career, we're in a job, sometimes we're spending hours and we're taking long shifts into the evening or maybe waking up early just to please our superiors, just to get the work done because we're understaffed. But there is no greater job than protecting the well being of your health. Sometimes when we're in a career, we put our career before our own well-being. And that, that sometimes leads to that downfall into that grief period because then you start becoming unhappy about the loss of time being spent with your loved one, time spent doing things that you enjoy. And you start developing sort of a fear that says, okay, well, if I don't go the extra mile and do this every time, I may lose my job or I may be replaced by somebody else who's willing to do that. And what I'm saying here as part of that grief process is that your well-being is the most important. This enables you to stand tall, to walk through and say, I know what I want. This is what makes me happy. And then again, losing your job doesn't define your career. It's just a chance to hit the restart button. There are times in life where we would love to have a restart button. And sometimes we just don't know how to get there because it's too painful for us to think about it. And we're in a job, but we want to change careers, but we just don't know how. But sometimes when you're forced into that notion of moving forward, something has to get eliminated. So having that chance to hit that restart button is really critical because it enables you to move forward, enables you to use that where am I going aspect. And ultimately, that's the key to help you rebound into a better opportunity. Uh, next slide. All right, so faith loss. Oh. Yeah, it's something that a lot of us have seen, have felt at some point in our lives. You know, religion played a certain important factor for different purposes. You can be very religious, you can be very just non-practicing, you may just observe certain holidays. But you know, when you have faith loss, is that the belief has stopped or it has become delusional and bitter or doubtful to something to somebody. And it's something where it may be derived from profound experiences, changing perceptions of social influences, right? You know, you prayed for a job promotion or you prayed for a loved one to get well and they didn't. And then you start casting blame and says, well, I did all the things I was supposed to do. I prayed, I did everything right. Like, why did this happen? And again, you're asking that why question that leads you back to that mourning phase. And when you lose faith, you have that feeling of emptiness and loneliness that follows. It's sort of like an unnatural buildup of resentment and despair that weighs heavily in your heart and soul. It's where you lose concentration. You may lose sleep. You may have short outbursts with you know, loved ones or even strangers on the streets. Everything just seems to take you off. And that comes back to the whole feeling of when you're losing your faith, you're losing your religion, you start giving up, you start overcompensating things. And you know, one of the key areas that you wanna ask yourself a question is, is, am I comparing myself to others? And it's just something where, again, we seek assurances from others, right? Are we on the right track? Should I be doing that? You know, what are you doing that maybe I'm not doing differently? And what happened there, going back to the first notion of being in your own marathon race, it's not up to what anybody else is doing. It's what you're comfortable with doing. And that's really a key critical aspect because you can't measure yourself, especially in any sort of grief, on how others. You may get tips, you may get suggestions, but use those as tips and suggestions, not as a blueprint 
or a baseline for what you're supposed to do. Again, I like to use analogies and in the, throughout the book, I write about different types of analogies that resonate well. And I always looked at a Rubik's cube, you know, one of those things where you turn, you know, it comes perfectly and all the, you know, colors are all represented when you first, and then you start playing around with it and it becomes completely garbled. And then you have no idea how to put it back together, right? And so what happens, you give up. But like each of these Rubik's cubes, to me, represent a different color with religion, faith, spirituality, health, relationships, and finance. And again, when you start trying to put it together and you're trying to match up the colors, you're starting to put together a little certain aspects in your life. And you're moving toward that where aspect because you're committed to trying to solve that Rubik's cube. And there are times when, again, being on that roller coaster, you get frustrated because you're going down a slope that's just filled with twists and turns and you just don't know what else to do. But these two Rubik's cubes are really, really great opportunities and a great representation to think about the six areas that most impact your life and how you're putting the pieces back together. The other area is when you look at, am I running away or standing stagnant, refusing to follow the path? I've always believed our lives, our script is written from the day we're born until the moment we ascend to the heavens above. But that particular script can be changed. It can be altered to different capacities. And we have the ability and everything that happens to us happens for a reason. We may not understand why, we may not understand how we got here. We may not even agree with it. But sometimes what happens is when we're in these situations, we just stay there. We don't know how to move forward. And we are defined in what the path should be taken. We know we're supposed to move forward, but we choose to stay behind because it's easier or maybe we get more satisfaction creating that negative aspect saying, well, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. So I'm gonna look for somebody else to guide me and to do it for me. Right, next slide. So, you know, believe you will succeed, trust your faith and let it guide you through the moments when you need it most, no matter what curveballs are thrown at you or how difficult your Rubik's Cube may be. And this summarizes a lot about what I look at faith is we never know what's coming around the corner, but we have to trust. I believe that God has put us in a position because we can handle it. And it's, it's a difficult concept to really think that through but everything is just a test. And things happen for a reason that we can't explain, good and bad, right? You know, sometimes you get lucky, right? You know, you happen to be standing next to somebody at the train station and somebody talked to you and said, hey, you know what? Let's trade information, phone numbers, let's get together and maybe there's an opportunity to do business with or maybe they introduce you to a loved one, or maybe there's an opportunity for you to get involved in more of a volunteer. Like everything happens. And I do believe that you're put in certain places as a test. And if you pass the test, you move on to the next aspect in your life. And that's your pathway, right? You get a series of tests. And if you don't pass the test, you sort of kind of go off into a different path until you can get back on to the path that God has created for you. But faith is not always about religion. It's about building trust or confidence in someone or something. It can be with your loved one to help them guide you through whatever turmoil that you may be feeling, whatever setback. But it's important to feel deep inside that, that confidence, that trust, because when you lose that confidence and trust, you start moving back into the why aspect of your mourning, into that grief period. If you're building up that trust, you're building up that confidence, you're putting more emphasis onto a relationship, or you want to see where something goes because you're 
have curiosity. You're moving yourself into that where aspect in life. Failure is caused by not because you lack physical strength, it's because you lack the mental conditioning needed to succeed. This is something where it's an empowerment into your mindset. To overcome grief, to overcome serious setbacks and challenges in your life, it's a mind. Now, there are other variables that play, right? You know, medicine, health, um, professionals, all these other little variables. In the end, it's all about you and how you move forward in life, how you keep those feet moving. Because when we stop, everything just slows down around us. And when you're moving around, you have more options available, more alternative paths that you can take down your ways. You know, faith is about trust. It's about building that connection between you and yourself internally and moving forward into that where aspect that we talk about so frequently. When you're dealing with grief loss, job loss, faith loss, a lot of times it all resembles the same notion. You're the same person going through it. And only you have that power to move <clears throat> forward in life and to live your life the way you want to. And, you know, as a result, um, if you go to the next slide, please. You know, this is where opportunities come from. I wrote a book. What did I know about writing a book? But I share my life experiences. I share different setbacks and challenges I have. And I've created a publishing company for Masada. And it wasn't until my trip to Israel in 2017 with a group of guys who I didn't even know at the beginning to come out with like lifelong brothers and friends out of this thing, produced this wonderful company that enabled me to publish this book. And what I've learned is when you have to keep those feet moving is, as long as you have that desire, that ambition, you can climb and soar new heights, no matter how difficult it may be. But once you ascend to the top, there is no greater reward and appreciation for just how far you've come. And that's what the Masada Publishing is, is to help others cope with and overcome grief. Uh, next slide. And again, uh, how you can contact us uh, at hello, keep those feet moving.com. I do respond pretty timely. Uh, any questions you may have, if you want to have a sit down, uh, more than happy to engage. But I will tell you, I am not a licensed professional. I'm not a substitute for seeking professional advice or anything like that. I'm here just to collaborate to help you move forward and help you grow internally and ultimately celebrate life. Thank you. Well, thank you, AJ, for uh, enlightening us this morning with your, your uh, presentation and thoughts, uh, all encompassed within your, your wonderful book, Keep Those Feet Moving. Uh, AJ, do you see yourself uh, producing a follow-up to uh, keep those feet moving, a sequel or some other uh, publication along the lines of the first one? I, I get that question a lot recently. Um, you know, writing a book, it, 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 it's you learn a lot about yourself, uh, and there's a lot of um, thought that goes into it. I hadn't really thought about writing a second follow-up book, but um, I think there might be another one that I'm thinking about. There's some other challenges that I have seen as of recent that I think would resonate well with the audience and different types of people. And, um, you know, eventually, you know, what I was going to think about doing is really steering and going deeper. Some of these chapters in the book, they kind of cover a high level viewpoint of certain things to help anybody who's going through any sort of grief. They can just jump right in and read different chapters that resonate best for them. Like some people may have lost a loved one and they want to read more about that, but 
they're unhappy with their spirituality and faith, so they may not read that. But textbook may just go deeper into some of these concepts that I talked about more today. Um, but you know, the beauty about keep those feet moving. I mean, there are options available. We're, we're still looking to see where it's going to take us. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you describe a little bit about your um, daytime job? So when I'm not, uh, uh, well, when I'm not educating and creating awareness for grief, uh, I'm in the uh, financial crimes uh, sector. I work for a, uh, a mid-sized bank uh, in the fraud area, looking for individuals that are defrauding not only the bank, but also the government with certain things. I work closely with a lot of the um, FBI, DEA, Homeland Security, Secret Service, and really heading up investigations in some of the uh, areas. And sometimes I dabble into money laundering uh, type counterterrorism aspects, but uh, I've been doing it for 20 years. I, I enjoy it. Uh, I like to believe I have a lot more network of people I know that are in jail than out of jail, but uh, it goes with the territory of uh, what I do. But financial crimes is really just how we look at different things and get you kind of equated back to the morning because somebody had felt the need that they wanted to defraud somebody because they have ambitions of money, prestige and power. But, you know, again, um, it's, it's, uh, it's a fascinating, it's not for everybody, but uh, financial crimes is definitely an area that you've got a lot of job security. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other uh, questions that anyone listening might want to pose to uh, AJ at this time? Uh, I have a comment, uh, not so much a question. Uh, we read the book and thought, you know, even if you're not going through some of these uh, types of grief, I think it could help in uh, different aspects of someone's life. But uh, we thought it was fantastic. Thanks, AJ. Thank you. I appreciate it. And that that's something that, you know, it's an opportunity. And that that's how we move forward, having those opportunities in life to help us grow and learn about who we are. Okay, if uh, there aren't any other questions, uh, again, uh, if anyone has a question, we can take it now. Otherwise, you yeah, can... I think, uh, yeah, we think we got some questions in the chat here. Um, yeah, I can't so, see. Yeah, first question, everything happened for a reason, but I have a hard time conceptualizing a reason for a spouse's death. Can you say more? So I certainly empathize with you. And... Again, I didn't understand it at the time that I was going through it. And losing a spouse, losing a loved one, no matter how long you've been together, is really a challenge. And the only reason that I can come up with is that everybody has a purpose in life. And there are different types of purposes that we go through without understanding, right? It could take us a lifetime, but when you feel that purpose, perhaps there's something more that's beyond. Now, when you lose a spouse, a loved one, a child or anything else, that person served a purpose in their life, in your life. Your goal, your purpose after is to create their legacy, is to grow, to help them continue to live and celebrate life. And it's really hard because you feel that void of a loved one. It's like, you know, it's hard because like, why does everybody else seem happy in their relationship? I don't have anybody, but there's something bigger than us all. And I really do believe from going back to the faith and spirituality notion is that we're here for a particular reason on earth and our job is to be tested and to grow, that we could not go through any of these tests unless God believes we handled it. And it's sad, it's horrifying to watch the loss of a loved one, especially a spouse who you waited your entire life to be with. But there's a purpose behind that. 
And that purpose is for you to continue to carry on. Now, you can remarry, you can choose not to remarry, but you're celebrating that life. That legacy will always continue to go. You are always gonna be a part of that person's legacy. And when you have that loss, there's a lot of challenges that come with it. But again, it's that physical void. It's that mourning phase as to why. But if you believe enough in yourself and you believe enough in what you're able to take on, you'd be surprised in these dark moments of what you're capable of doing. And it's up to you to say, I don't like it. It doesn't feel good, but I'm gonna do something. I'm gonna create a mission. And maybe like my mission, didn't understand it at the time in 2009 when I lost my wife, that I would start a mission and lead a movement of keep those feet moving in honor of my wife to help others grow. Everything has a defined purpose. Sometimes it's easier to find, sometimes it's not. But I, I empathize with you, I, I understand, but there are greater pastures coming your way. Uh, I think there was another one. There was another one. Um, okay, same family loss at the same time. So brain tumors, uh, I was just actually talking about this uh, yesterday night uh, with uh, one of our group of friends that we were out for dinner with. Um, you know, in 2009, there were some different types of treatments available for those that have tumors. And there are new programs since, you know, proton therapy, there's some other uh, really powerful drugs that are out there. I haven't really dabbled as much into the newer technology today than it was back then. I spent a lot of time looking at, at studying about the different interactions of chemo versus radiation for brain tumors. And we all know brain tumors are just ugly. And depending on the type of tumor you're dealing with could also impact the type of course of treatment, longevity. But what I will say this, anybody who's going through any sort of cancer, any sort of medical ailment, I get what the doctors say. I get what all the statistics and all that other stuff. But I will challenge you to think positively. Doctors can be wrong. Medical science could actually help, but we don't know how people are and what that individual who's dealing with that ailment, again, it goes into that mindset. There are people who wanna fight. There are people that want to grow and say, I'm not accepting this. I am going to beat this. I'm going to fight every opportunity that I can. And those are the people that have a higher chance of overcoming and beating cancer. And until the moment that it's all exhausted, you have to continue to remain in that fight. I mean, brain tumors, the glioblastoma, multiborn, I've seen what it can do. I've said, you know, I refuse to accept. And I'll share this personal aspect. So when my wife was diagnosed with the glioblastoma, they told me she would never walk or talk again. And when she came out of surgery uh, in the post-op, when I went to go visit her, um, she didn't talk in English. <laughs> she actually spoke Spanish, which is a second language. And I learned very quickly that the doctors could be wrong on that aspect. The fact that she spoke Spanish, not English, they told me she would never walk or talk. Already she proved them wrong right from there in the post-op. And that's where, again, things in life do happen for certain reasons. And sometimes certain protocols, they say this is what the outcome is gonna be, but nobody really knows what that outcome is gonna be. You just have to learn 
to stand, to fight, to do everything you can. I do believe we are on the cutting edge for all medical science and how to aggressively combat tumors, whether it's in the brain, pancreatic, ovarian, breast cancer, any type like lungs, like there are phenomenal types of treatments, amazing studies that are being done. And without going into a whole lot of the medical aspects that I'm understanding and reading these journals, it, there is a fight. So never lose sight. And I do believe there is progress that is being made daily. It all comes down to your um, the individual who's fighting it, the support, and also the medical treatments. And don't accept if they say there's nothing we can do, push. <clears throat> and if you want to talk further about, you know, again, you can always contact me and I'll be more than happy to sit down with anybody and just go through these experiences and, and, and help open doors for anything. Okay, um, thank you, AJ. Uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, we have another webinar coming up next uh, Sunday, 9 a.m. Central, 10 Eastern, and it is going to focus on the Black Israelites. And our presenter will be uh, one of the uh, leading researchers for the Wiesenthal Center, uh, tied in with all sorts of uh, innovation and studies relative to anti-Semitism uh, in the United States and the focus on the Black Israelites. So uh, if you have uh, questions for AJ, here is the information on the screen. Otherwise, plan to sign up for our program next uh, Sunday morning, March the 5th. And uh, have a good afternoon, good, good morning, wherever you might be uh, listening from. And uh, thanks to AJ, and uh, again, thank you, AJ, for your time. No, thank you for the opportunity, everyone. So that concludes our program for this morning, and uh, we'll be uh, introducing other programs and topics uh, as we move along here in uh, 2023. Thank you, and uh, have a good day.